Welcome to the third episode in a Legendarium series about the Wars of the Roses. In this installment, England's Bloodiest Day, we will talk about the rise of Edward, Duke of York, and how he made himself king after the Battle of Towton. At the Battle of Wakefield on December 30th, 1460, Queen Margaret, wife of Henry VI, defeated the Yorkists and captured Richard and his second son, Edmund. The Mad King Henry VI, meanwhile, wandered through his palace in a daze, oblivious to what went on. Though the York family showed King Henry VI clemency when they captured him years before, Queen Margaret decapitated Duke Richard and his son Edmund, displaying their heads outside York. A second son, named Edward, survived. He took his father's title as Duke of York and swore to avenge the murder of his family. Mere weeks after the defeat and death of his father at Wakefield, the 18-year-old Duke Edward of York marched his followers northwards to depose Henry VI through force. He was joined by his father's old ally, Earl Richard Neville, better known as Warwick the Kingmaker. Indeed, his mother Cecily was the Kingmaker's aunt, and at six feet four inches tall, young Duke Edward certainly looked the part of a king. The York and Lancaster armies met at a small farming village that would soon have an infamous name, Towton. The two huge armies, estimated at between 50,000 and 65,000 men confronted each other between the villages of Towton and Saxton in North Yorkshire. Commanders on both sides issued orders to their men to offer no quarter to enemies who surrendered, which ensured a bloodbath. Despite it being April, an awesome wind blew up behind the backs of the York forces and into the faces of the Lancastrians. On top of that, it began snowing, so neither side could truly see one another. Yet the wind blowing in their faces ensured that the Lancastrian archers could not shoot straight. On the other hand, Yorkist archers, aided by the wind, still fired in the direction of their Lancastrian enemy, whose own arrows fell short. For several hours, the battle raged until the Lancastrians finally lost their nerve. The Yorkist forces drove the Lancastrian army into a nearby stream. Slowed by the water, the York rebels easily butchered the Lancastrians in such numbers that the water ran red for days. 28,000 people died in the bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil, numbers comparable to the soldiers who died each day at the Somme more than 450 years later in an industrial age war fought with machine guns rather than blades. Duke Edward almost became one of the many dead. During the battle, the future king had his life saved by a Welsh knight named Sir David Ap Matthew. As a reward for Matthew's bravery, upon becoming king only days later, Edward of York made him standard bearer of England and gave him use of the name Towton on his own humble family coat of arms. Queen Margaret learned of the disaster, and knowing what to expect at Edward's hands after murdering his father and elder brother, she fled with her seven-year-old son, Edward of Westminster, to her home country of France. After the crushing victory, Edward did what his father never found the boldness to do. He had King Henry VI deposed and crowned himself King Edward IV of England. To be sure, he went to great effort to portray this bloody coup as a restoration of the real royal line, publishing genealogies which, with a little tinkering, showed that he actually had a stronger claim to the throne than King Henry VI. So no wonder that God abandoned the king at Towton. The deposed Henry VI went to the Tower of London. Curiously, he seems to have enjoyed himself there after many stormy years as king. He took up writing poetry with nothing else to do. And by keeping Henry VI alive, the Lancastrians could not claim Edward of Westminster to be 
King Edward V, depriving them of a powerful symbol. Parliament, hoping for an end to the wars above all else, approved the ascent of King Edward IV. Yet most of the nobility still saw Henry VI as the true king. Yet the utter ruin of the Lancastrian army at Towton became the main reason Edward IV kept the throne. Yet he had to rely heavily upon Warwick the Kingmaker to help him rule the country. Seeing himself as the senior partner in government, Warwick took the lead on policy decisions, including the king's marriage. Warwick intended for King Edward IV to marry one of the female relations of the French king. Instead, a few years after taking the throne, Elizabeth Woodville caught King Edward's eye. According to legend, they met on the side of the road, where Woodville stood under an oak tree with her sons. A young widow whose husband died at Towton, she wished to petition Edward IV to give her back the land of her late husband. Instead, Edward IV insisted that Elizabeth become his mistress. Not one to be bullied, the widow pulled out a dagger and put it against her own throat. Somehow, this led to a mutual respect, romance, and finally a wedding. The new Queen Elizabeth had 12 siblings, many of whom began to receive advantageous marriages and appointment to high office. Indeed, one of King Edward's reasons for marrying the relatively low-born Elizabeth Woodville was so he could build his own power base outside the great noble houses. But upon learning of King Edward's wedding to a mere commoner, Warwick the Kingmaker became infuriated likely as he believed that he would be the power behind the throne. This marriage also undid years of diplomatic work Warwick did in France and Burgundy. As if to add insult to injury, Edward IV then married off Warwick's 65-year-old Aunt Catherine to his wife's 19-year-old brother John, a union remembered as the diabolical marriage. Warwick convinced Edward's younger brother George, the Duke of Clarence, to rebel against the king in 1469. A rebel army captured King Edward IV at Edgecote Moor in July 1469. Immediately, Warwick and Clarence executed Elizabeth's brother and father. Unfortunately for them, while the nobility disliked Edward IV, they had no wish to resume the wars to bring George to the throne. With no choice, Warwick agreed to release Edward in September 1469, and King Edward IV forgave Warwick and George for their rebellion, in part because he had no one else to help him rule England. Meanwhile, across the English Channel, Margaret of Anjou saw the rebel ranks splitting and sharpened her swords. What happens next, we'll find out in the next episode. I hope you enjoyed this installment of The Legendarium. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.